Family Theater presents Edmund O'Brien and Dorothy Warrenshold. From Hollywood, the Mutual Network, in cooperation with Family Theater, presents The Visitor, starring Edmund O'Brien. And now, here is your hostess, Dorothy Warren Show. Thank you, Tony Lafrano. Family Theater's only purpose is to bring to everyone's attention a practice that must become an important part of our lives if we are to win peace for ourselves peace for our families, and peace for the world. Family Theater urges you to pray, pray together as a family. And now, to our transcribed drama, The Visitor, starring Edmund O'Brien as Anders. For the last time, Major, are you going to let me off this field? For the last time, no. And you know why, Mr. Anders. And you won't let me fire my story from here. No. Look, you say I know why. I don't know why. And frankly, I think you're a little bit of a fool for this attitude. For the first time in the history of the world, we're visited by someone from another planet. For the first time in the history of the world, we are given a solution for all the troubles this earth is heir to. By someone who might know. And you, you, you want to play dictator and withhold... That's infa- enough, Mr. Anders. It's not enough. This isn't a military installation. It's a private airfield. And this isn't a military matter. It concerns everybody. And get this, Major Winners. I'm going to print this story while it'll still do some good, with your help or without it. And if your guest from outer space dies before I do print it, you can bet your life you'll never be a colonel. Get out of here, Don't Anders. Don't order me around, Junior. I'm not under martial law. I'll be over at the cafe eating if you decide to change your mind, if you still got a mind. Well, if it isn't the poor man's William Shakespeare. Hello, Millie. What do you have? I'll tell you what. Give me a cup of hot water with a squirt of chocolate syrup in it and a gob of whipped vegetable oil on top, huh? about our hot chocolate with whipped cream again. Alleged hot chocolate and reportedly whipped cream, Millie. Never button yourself down with an exact statement. There's too much risk. You been drinking? Fighting. Oh, the Major still won't let you tell the world, huh? That's right. Well, he's only doing his job. But you know what doesn't seem right? No, no, you tell me what doesn't seem right. With that funny little guy so sick, why don't they take him to a hospital? He shouldn't be moved. They're treating him all right. Brought almost a whole hospital here to keep him alive. Wonder what he's got. Who knows? He's so fragile it could be anything from a hangnail on up. Yeah, I can see it now. Martian visitor dies of hangnail. Hey! What are you putting in that chocolate? Powdered milk? Well, the place has been swamped with soldiers, so I'm all out of canned and fresh. Still want it? Yeah, I'll take it. But Millie, my love, when you start making it out of powdered water, that's where I draw the line. Do you suppose the little guy could be part of a plan? Plan? Yeah, he comes here real sick. Okay, so maybe everybody else catches what he's got. You see? Yeah. And everybody dies, and then they invade. Invade? Yeah, you know, what you call it, warfare, bio, Yeah, biological. You got a point, but it's not too probable, Millie. Not too probable? So a six-story bowling ball with a little man inside makes a perfect landing in the middle of runway 2-1. That's probable? Before he even gets out of the thing, he turns green with what the doc says looks like a cross between diphtheria and typhoid fever. Is that improbable? Yes, but if you talk to the guy, you... Talk to him? I don't even want to get near him. Here's your chocolate. Pardon me. I mean, here's what usually reliable sources tell me is hot chocolate. Thanks. Don't thank me. You're paying for it. Mr. Anders? Yes? Major Winters would like to see you, sir, in his office. Hey, maybe he's changed his mind. No, Millie, my love. With my luck, he's probably going to tell me I've been drafted. Major, you wanted to see me? Uh, Yes, come in, Mr. Anders. Sit down. You can write your story now if you'd like. I can? The visitor is dead. Dead? He's been dead for almost an hour. 
than you knew it the last time I was in here. I've been waiting for an autopsy report. You'll see when you read it why I was obliged to keep a news blackout about this whole affair. May I see it? I just got my information by telephone. I'll see that you get the coroner's written report within the next few minutes. I see. In the meantime, you're free to use my telephone to file your story. I'll see that you're not disturbed. All right. Man on the switchboard will place your call. And, uh, Anders, if I were you, I'd wait for the coroner's report before writing me up as a villain. Uh, Major, you, uh, you don't mind if I write the truth? No, Mr. Anders, but write all the truth. I and... will. Hello? Please get me Rhinelander 7, 5111. What's... Los Angeles, thank you. Hello, Judy? This is Lou Anders. Give me the city room, will you? And tie me in with rewrite. Thanks. Hiya, Willard. Lou, I got something for you. Now, get this, Will. It'll sound like science fiction, but it's not, and I don't want it rewritten. Just copy it and print it. Ready? All right. Here she comes. Dateline, Delano Airport, three miles west of Delano, California, Wednesday, April 21st, 1955. A little more than four hours ago, a spaceship landed at this field. It came from the planet Mars and was flown here by a living Martian. A human being of flesh and blood with the same kind of thoughts, the same kind of emotions, even the same feelings as you and I. I have spoken with this man from Mars and so have high-ranking officials of this government. The following is a factual account of the events concerning this strange occurrence. Am I going too fast for you? No, all right. On April 21st, this reporter, while en route to Delano, California, was stopped at a military roadblock 30 miles north of the New Hall Saugus turnoff on Highway 99. No, no, no. I'm not going to turn around and go back. I'm working for the Los Angeles Daily Post-Dispatch. I'm on my way to see a man in Delano regarding a story. What kind of a story, this sir? This is none of your business, Junior, and I'm not in the Army. Nor am I on Army property, but on a highway, which was paid for by taxes I paid with gasoline. Yes, sir, I'm sorry, but this highway's closed to traffic for the time being, and you'll just, just have, have to, to go, go back, back the, the other way. way. Look, I've talked to two yardbirds, one corporal and you, Sergeant, and I'm still not going back. You might save my time, your time, and the Army's time if you'll just take me to your commanding officer. I'm sorry, sir. This is a restricted area. Not on my map, it isn't. You want to go around again, Sergeant? If you do, I'd like to call your attention to the fact that I was a private in the last war. I went in as a private, and I came out as a private. So I'm not about to take any more orders from any more sergeants. Shall we go in your Jeep or in my car? Okay, Mac. Follow me. Just remember it was your idea. I'll keep it in mind. We tried to keep him away, Major. But... That's right, Major, but I wouldn't go. All right, Sergeant, return to your post. Yes, sir. Just what did you hope to gain, Mr. Anders? Access to the city of Delano. Why? For my paper. I'm going to see a man who lives there and confirm a story. Would you mind telling me what kind of a story? Well, a farmer called the paper said a strange kind of aircraft had been hovering over his south pasture all morning. Strange kind of aircraft? That's right, a big silver ball. He said it was about twice as big as his barn. He didn't say what size barn he had. Did he say anything else about it? Yes, he said it glowed for one thing and that he's been taking pictures of it with his Kodak all morning. He called us thinking he could get a good price for the pictures. And he said he thought somebody ought to know about it. Do you think he called any other newspapers? I don't think so. It sounded pretty good, so we asked him not to. You wanted an exclusive? That's right. Good. What was the farmer's name? I'm not at liberty to say, Major. You know, Mr. Anders, these rumors about flying discs from other worlds can be very dangerous as well as ridiculous. Yes, I thought so, but now I'm not so sure. You've closed one of California's arterial highways and made a restricted area out of a pretty good-sized swatch of farmland. You must have a reason, Major. And I'll give you eight to one. It isn't war games. We'll drive over to the field and I'll show you why, if you want. But you can't write about it, at least not for a while. Uh -huh. I'll have to ask that you not leave the area of the, um, 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 the occurrence until you have my permission. This is a pretty big thing. It's beginning to look that way. Uh, about these conditions, have any other papers been admitted? No, and I can assure you that none will be. Then let's go. (laughs) 
Is that what your farmer told you about? Holy cow. Would you believe me and go back home if I told you that this was one of our super secret weapons? No. Well, I didn't think so. Want to take a look? Let's go. It's been right here in the middle of the runway for the last three hours. It's not on the ground, is no, it? No, it's hovering about three feet off the ground. It don't seem to be equipped with landing gear. Well, Major, I don't want to seem stupid, but what is the thing? Well, this fellow coming toward us should be able to tell us. He's Arnold Griffith of Mount Palomar. Oh, uh, Dr. Griffith. Major Winters. Dr. Griffith, this is Lewis Anders of the Post-Dispatch. How do you do? How do you do, sir? Anything happen? Not so far. We found that the glow it gives off is not from heat and it is not radioactive. And from sonar soundings, we found that it seems to be hollow or very nearly so. Well, that's a relief. Relief? Why? Well, there was some conjecture, Mr. Anders, that it might be a guided missile of another power containing explosives. <laughs> I, mean, I mean the missile, not the power. Oh, yes, of course. Hey, wait a minute. If it isn't a missile, then then it must be from outer space. Well, that's not necessarily the case, Anders. Major, Dr. Griffith, come quick. We'll discover something. Yeah, come on. Yes. Just listen, sir. All right, hit it again, Wooly. All right. Well, what's those things? Uh, shush, 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 listen. There's somebody in there. There sure is. And I don't like it, Major. I don't like it at all. Then, Willie, I want cover here. Have all available weapons aimed and ready. Yes, sir. Right away, Major. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. Suppose whoever's in there is friendly. Well, whoever he, she, or it is, they're not going to surprise us. What the sand? I hell? wouldn't make book on it, Major. It's coming down. Gentlemen, let's leave. That's the best idea I've heard yet, Professor. a strange sensation watching the landing. I was conscious, and I think the others were, that a big decision had been made by whoever or whatever was at the controls of that strange sphere-shaped machine. The action of landing crushed the base of it like an eggshell. Major, you gotta get that man out of there. We don't know that there is a man in it, Anders. We don't know. It could be a big mistake, but mistake? I... Mistake? There's a man in there. You heard him. Well, how do you know? You call that tapping evidence? Could be like opening Pandora's What are box. you, Griffith, a witch doctor? Listen, you. That could still be a guided missile. And it could be that if it is from outer space, it could have almost everything. New diseases, almost anything. Still, in the name of science. Name of science. In the name of God, you'd better do what's right about this. That thing is an aircraft, and it apparently was crash-landed by a human being. You'd better try to get him out. Or you'll see what public sentiment can do. And believe me, I'm just the man that can stir it up. Anders, if you... Winters, what are your orders, sir? Cut it open. If there's anyone inside, get him out. Yes, sir. All right, you men, come with me. I'm, enough... I'm going over there. Now, wait a minute, doctor. Anders, you've had a lot to say since you arrived. Now I've got something to say. Don't ever threaten me with public indignation or anything else again. With God as my judge, I'm going to try to do my duty as I see it. And, Mr. Anders, I don't need any pencil-pushing newsboy to point it out for me. Lieutenant Woolley. Yes, sir. Take Mr. Anders over to the airport cafe and see that he stays until I tell you otherwise. Yes, sir. We're under arrest? You can call it that, yes. Come on, Doctor. Where are you going? I'll ask your advice just once for the record. If that thing out there that my men are working on with the acetylene torch is a bomb, where do you think I ought to be? Some more coffee, Lieutenant? No, not right now, thanks. You want some more chocolate? Hey. What? Want me to make you some more chocolate? Uh, oh, no, no thanks. What are you writing, a letter? He's a newspaper man. He's going to make this place famous. Aren't you, Mr. Anders? Oh, you're writing your story, huh? That's right. My name is uh, Mildred Wilson. W-I-L-S-O-N? <laughs> yeah. You get what I mean. Mine's Louie Anders. Call me Lou. How do you do? Tell me, Millie... Uh, you don't mind if I call you Millie? No, not at all. Uh, tell me, Millie, why aren't you out in the field watching things? Aren't you interested? In... Interested? I'm scared to death of that thing. I don't want to have anything to do with it. Smart girl. Well, at least I'm alive, and I'd like to keep it that way. Uh, I see. Well, that thing could be a big booby trap, you know. And you're not the booby who's going to be trapped. Well, in a manner of speaking, that's right. Don't mind the lieutenant. He's just bitter. About it being a trap, you know, there's somebody inside of this thing, a human being. And there wouldn't be a human being inside a bomb. Oh, 
Oh, no. What about the kamikazes? And who says it's a human being? Oh, you read too much science fiction, Millie. All I know is they've been trying to get that thing open since before it got dark so they can let who knows what out. And when they do... Oh, Lieutenant. I... Uh, yeah? Major Winters would like you and Mr. Anders to report out in the field immediately, sir. Keep that light right on the opening there. I want it flooded with light. You want us, Major? No, Mr. Anders, yeah. Looks like you're making quite a production out of this. Then, Willie, you may return to your company. I'll take care of Mr. Anders here. Captain Clegg? Yes, sir? Now, I want cover. Remember, you're to fire and keep firing until this thing is completely destroyed, if anything happens. Whether we're out or not. Yes, sir. What's going on? We're going inside, Mr. Anders. I thought you might like to come along. Of course, you realize that you might not come out again. You heard my last order. Yes. Well? Let's go. Dr. Griffin? I'm ready. Let's go in. It was a strange sensation entering the sphere. It seemed as we crossed that torn threshold that we were entering into another world. And as we found later, that was really what we were doing. Major, look at all that equipment. Uh, looks like the inside of a radio. Wonderful. I mean, wonderful workmanship. A very superior equipment. Dr. Griffith, look! Well, Good evening, gentlemen. Don't be afraid. I am old and really quite harmless. What do you make of it, Doctor? A human being, but strange proportions. Look at his chest. Large. He is from a much lighter atmosphere than ours. Would you come closer so that I may see you? I would come to you, but I am afraid the gravity is much too heavy for me. I have been wondering for a long time what you look like. We, uh, we've been wondering the same thing about you. Yes, I know. You know? I have been listening to your radio programs for a long time. For ten years, to be exact. Ten years? They'll never believe this back at Palomar. That is how I learned your language, listening to your radio. According to some of the programs of about two and three o'clock in the day, the males have an easy time in life, while the females are always beset with difficulties. Is that right? <laughs> the soap operas. He must have been listening to the soap operas. Oh, this is out of this world. A man from Mars flying around in our atmosphere listening to soap operas. I was making a joke. You will pardon me if I am not very funny. I am just learning. You see, we did not laugh on my planet. Tell me, just why did you come here? There was no other place to go. Life on my home world had ceased to exist. It is the planet you call Mars. Ceased to exist? It was destroyed in our last war. I am the last. You are the last? Well, how do you know? I mean, how can you be sure? You have not seen the great scar across the face of my planet? The canals of Mars? Canals? No, oh no. It is the scar of our last war, some 350 years ago by your time, caused by cosmic artillery. This ship, this little planet I have lived in for so long, was the relay station the reflector for the burst that caused that scar. Wait. If that's true, then this... all this equipment must contain the answer to cosmic energy. How to transform the cosmic rays of the sun into tremendous energy. Is that true? It is true. But I warn you, I have been listening to you, to your radio programs, to your news commentators, to the speeches of those in power all over your world. Your world is not ready for this knowledge. Not ready? Your planet, like mine, grows quickly in knowledge. 
but oh so slow in understanding. But so much good could be accomplished. Good, yes. But there are forces here working against good and they are very strong. I have been listening. These forces are trying to do what was done on my world. They are trying to force God out of your world. Trying to force God out. They exclude God from the conference table as we did. They would make gods of science and state as we did. They would deny him what is his due and run your world according to their own plan, which is a godless plan. And hear me, where God is not, there you will find only evil. Your world is in great danger now. You must bring God back to your conference tables, back into your homes and classrooms, and don't listen to those who tell you there is a way without God. They will be lying to you. No man, no planet, no solar system can, can exist, exist without God. Someone help me out. Help me quickly. Is he dead? I, I can't find any pulse. He may not have any, Major. He seems to be made on a little different pattern than we are. It might be that the pressure here is too great for him. We'll have to get him to an iron lung or a decompression chamber to find out. I'll get some help. A medic! A medic! The Martian visitor was kept in an iron lung and breathing almost pure oxygen till just one hour ago. And one hour ago at 8.27 Pacific Standard Time, the last living citizen of Mars, the first Martian ambassador to Earth, died. That's about as far as I've gone, except for the coroner's report and major winners. Wait a minute, here he is with it now. This line, uh, this line right here will tell you what you want to know. Wait a minute, Chief. Where? Right here. What? Pneumonic plague. Read the rest. It says it only looked like pneumonic plague. Oh, yeah, yeah, I see. Hello, Willard, get this. The Army sustained a news blackout for a time because the visitor was feared to have been carrying pneumonic plague, a highly contagious and usually fatal disease. However, the autopsy proved that death was brought on by the formation of nitrogen bubbles in the bloodstream. Yeah, you've heard about it. Yeah, it's the same thing deep sea divers get from too much pressure. They call it the bends. Says here he also had pulmonary complications, breathing trouble. That's right. Our air was just too heavy for him. He wants pictures. Can you send a man out? No. Oh, now, wait a minute. You've gone this far. You... I'll see that you get official photos. You can take them along with you. Fair enough. Okay, I'll bring some, Willard. I'll call you if there's anything else. Well, that's that. Well, may I come in? Oh, certainly, Dr. Griffith. Come in. Take a chair. Well, another ten minutes and it'll be all over. And the secret of cosmic energy will be lost for perhaps another thousand years. What are you talking about? I set fire to the sphere, Mr. Anders. You what? A few thermite bombs in the right place. You see, Mr. Anders, Major Winters has done his share. Ah, oh, I see. You're taking the little man's advice, huh? Eh? Doing my best to. Mr. Anders, weren't you saying something earlier this evening about being just the man to stir up public sentiment? Yes, I guess I did, Doc. Uh... Mm. Hey, let's go out and take a closer look, huh? You don't see a thing like this every day. I suggest that you get your photographs and go, Anders, while you've still got time. I'm expecting some top brass to land here this evening, and when they find out what happened... I... Find out what happened? Dr. Griffith, wouldn't you say spontaneous combustion is a dangerous thing? Yes, oh, yes, I would. In fact, Captain Clegg and some of the other soldiers were talking with me about it just a few moments ago. Hello, Major. Kind of warm this evening, isn't it, sir? Oh, hello, man. Yes, yes, it is a little warm, Captain. Nothing left. Nothing at all. Sergeant, get that fire equipment out there. Hey, Captain Clegg, what Listen. are your men doing? Oh, well, Major, I wouldn't want it to appear on the record we didn't try to put that fire out. It couldn't have that, sir. 
Looks like we're going to be too late, though. Too bad. Was this your idea, Dr. Griffith? Well, sir, I, I just told your men what the Martian said, and, uh, well, it seemed like it was everybody's idea. Thank you, Doctor. How do you feel about it, Mr. Anders? Accidents will happen, Captain. Well, looks like there's nothing left but the story, so I guess I'll pick up my pictures and go. Major Winters, I, uh, well, I don't want to sound corny, but I'd like to shake your hand. My pleasure, Anders. I hope you're a good reporter, Mr. Anders, because yours is a pretty big job. Reporter? I'm not a reporter anymore. Haven't you heard, Doctor? I just turned missionary a few minutes ago. This is Dorothy Warrenshold again. Although there was a lot of fiction in tonight's play, there were some things in it that definitely were not fiction. Remember the visitor's message? There are forces working to destroy you and your world. That part, tragically, was very true. These forces are at work, and they are trying to exclude God from world activities, trying to replace him with science and state and run the world according to their, their own godless plans. We must wage a personal war against these forces, the communists and the secularists, and see that they make no further inroads here in this country. We can do it by keeping God in the home through family prayer, for the home is the basic and most important unit of the nation, and family prayer by bringing God into the home and making him a part of the family will strengthen the family and therefore strengthen the nation. For as the family that prays together stays together, so too a world at prayer is a world at peace. More things are wrought by prayer than this world dreams of. From Hollywood, the Family Theater has brought you transcribed The Visitor, starring Edmund O'Brien. Dorothy Warren Schold was your hostess. Others in our cast were Leo Curley, Parley Bear, Joyce McCluskey, Lawrence Dobkin, Howard Culver, and Barney Phillips. The script was written and directed for Family Theater by Robert Hugh O'Sullivan, with music composed and conducted by Harry Zimmerman. This series of family theater broadcasts is made possible by the thousands of you who feel the need for this type of program, by the mutual network which has responded to this need, and by the hundreds of stars of stage, screen, and radio who give so unselfishly of their time and talent to appear on our family theater stage. To them and to you, our humble thanks. This is Tony Lafrano expressing the wish of family theater that the blessing of God may be upon you and your home, and inviting you to be with us next week when family theater will present Caboose. Starring James Gleason and Hugh O'Brien. Join us, won't you? <laughs> Family Theater is broadcast throughout the world and originates in the Hollywood studios of the world's largest network. This is Mutual, the radio network for all America. <laughs>